All right, greetings from the dark continent, Conscious Caracal here, or Adams Van Sail. And tonight I'm going to be discussing thoughts from the dark continent. Now, this isn't going to be a, a in-depth dive into an essay I wrote or into a uh, or an interview with a guest. Uh, let me show you, just make sure my chair doesn't move the table. Um, but rather, this is going to be me uh, sharing some of the thoughts that I've had surrounding Africa in particular, and some of the impressions that I've gotten about the continent from growing up here and uh, doing a lot of travel here, specifically in South Africa and Southern Africa uh, recently. Um, and that's the thing, as I want to share some of those thoughts, but at the same time, uh, figure out some of them for myself as I share them. Because the thing is, if I want, I want to uh, write an essay containing many of these thoughts, but at the same time, if I were to write such an essay, I still need to decide where to share it or where to uh, who would publish it. I don't know exactly what the right platform for it would be. But uh, yeah, we'll see where it goes. I've got a lot of notes. These are the ty the notes that I made when uh, while me and my girlfriend's family were um, traveling in southern Africa. We went to Botswana, uh, Zambia, and Namibia. And while we were traveling, I made a lot of notes because uh, we were spending time very close to nature we were the majority of the time camping and living very closely to nature so yeah uh, i want to share some of those thoughts here tonight but you can also share your thoughts uh, the live chat section is open so you can have your questions and thoughts there i will be uh, incorporating them into the conversation as as we go along so you might have noticed the thumbnail of tonight's episode and that's a, a braai fire that uh, all south africans will know when they see it especially afrikaners and uh, that's because tonight's conversation is going to touch on things that are talked about around braai fires these types of themes and ideas and aesthetics that i'm going to be covering tonight and touching on are the things that come to the fore around the braai fire maybe not in the form that i'm going to or the format that i'm going to be talking about it tonight but it is something that's always in the background it's the things that are woven into all the stories and that's why uh, i did that episode on the importance of the storyteller just a, a while back uh, in april because that theme also Co uh, correlates to tonight's theme or connects to tonight's theme of conversation and that is these archetypes and aesthetics and ideas that come to the fore through stories so let's see i see people are coming in i see defrayed to watch it says good evening adams good evening defrayed to watch and nice to see you here um and then i see <clears throat> uh there's some questions here from brett i'll get to them uh later in the show if i have time uh tonight i'm not going to be answering political questions in regards to current events or the news uh if you have questions regarding the theme you'll get the idea of what i'm talking about tonight very quickly um i'll get to those questions and those comments unfortunately not going to be covering current events tonight um all right jonathan says uh evening adams evening all evening jonathan kermit says hello hello kermit nice to see you and uh, yeah, I think we can uh, we can start getting into it. So there's a, a saying that I don't I can't really say that that I came up with it, but I can't for the life of me find the source. So this is how I remember it. But it's my memory is patchy because this wasn't a profound memory. It was just a little scrap memory that later became very significant. So. I think during second or first year at university, I was doing a paper on something, something lame, like some BS topic of like renewable energy in Africa. And I was looking for sources to read. And one of the sources I was reading, um, I can't remember if it was a report or an article or just a little story somewhere or, or a, a news story or whatever. I can't remember what it was, but it was a document that detailed some type of green energy project uh in uh western africa a european energy project uh by like belgium or denmark or one of those countries and long story short they built i think wind turbines uh there or solar panel like see i don't remember i'm trying to piece these these details aren't really important but anyway so what stood out to me was during this uh, while i was reading the source just for this little trivial paper that i had to write for i think political science um 
one of the stories there was so while they were when they had finished this green energy project um the they gave they gave training to the locals told them how to maintain it how to keep it nice and uh, operating and everything and then years later they came back and to find it broken down in disarray and they asked one of the locals they what happened and then he said and this is how i remember it um so i might be paraphrasing you're not going to be able to fight even if you type in this direct quote but this is how i remember it he said uh while people from your community are here talking about europeans um you uh you bring your uh, skills and magic with you but when you leave back to wherever you came from you take that with you and you have to remember in your absence uh things work a bit differently here in africa because the old gods still rule here it's a <laughs> It's a strange quote from a nothing little article or report or whatever that had nothing to do with the paper that I was writing in university, but it stuck with me. And it's just, I've just remembered that quote. It's like seared into my memory. The old gods still rule here in Africa. And I'm going to get into that in this episode and what I think he meant by that, um, by that uh, quote. So when it comes to the continent of Africa, it's a, a continent that's very close to reality and human nature. You don't have as much uh, a, such a history of social engineering and taming of nature as you have, for example, in a place like Europe. Um, there's still a lot of raw nature here. Um, it's still very real. It's still in your face. So when it comes to things like, for example, the, the forces of nature, uh, uh you'll see in africa is abundant in examples of old buildings crumbling and being taken back by nature the the vines growing over it animals coming to live in those uh buildings uh it's something in south africa specifically that's that always strikes me is when you drive for example through an area like the the eastern free state all the old farmhouses there that are just ruins with nature slowly retaking it and it's something that you see all across africa it's not unique to africa but it is a something very particular and it's that retaking that destruction of civilization that retaking of that was that all that is man-made by nature is very in your face in africa much less so than it would be in a place like america or europe and you get this feeling, that feeling of mortality, that nothing lasts, everything from dust back to dust is very, very evident in Africa. And that man does not rule uh, over, that doesn't have, man doesn't have complete control over nature. Nature is also a force that can take back what is, uh, what is hers. And that those natural forces that how nature retakes a building, for example, um, that untamedness, that is what I think that if you don't take into account the, the human element, that's one of the old gods that are still ruling here in Africa, that, that supremeness of nature, the, the power of nature to still uh, deal some blows to, to humanity's efforts to tame her. But then at the same time, there's also the old gods of man that before the Enlightenment, not uh, cultures that have been uh, westernized but rather cultures that are still in their element in regards to how they were before intervention from europe um, there's still a lot of elements in in africa that are long gone in europe for example uh, the belief in magic the belief in witchcraft these things are long gone in europe but still very strong in africa and south africa specifically you get a, a strong sense of that people here are still stoned for being witches and burned for that and that's also, that's a, an old god of human nature that's still ruling here. And again, I'm not talking about real gods. I'm talking about in the metaphorical sense, just to make sure that we're, we're on the same page. So that that's the short story of that quote. And it just stuck with me for so long that here in Africa, the old gods still rule. And it's become like a little bit of a saying for me when I, whenever I see something that's truly African, something like a scene or a an event that's really true to Africa and how it goes here in Africa. I just say, yeah, you have to remember the old gods still rule here. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to claim that I invented that. Um, uh, <laughs> but that's the story. I wish I could. I'm, I'm, I wish I could find the original source again. But like I said, it lost to time in some 
trivial piece of policy policy paper somewhere out there about <laughs> about renewable energy in Africa. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Hmm. All right. If you have any uh, questions regarding this topic or what I'm discussing, you can put it in the chat. But I, uh, I see uh, uh, you guys are chatting up a storm. I'll get to the chat. I'll, I'll uh, identify a time in the in the stream where I'm going to really uh, check out what's going on in the chat. But I first want to get uh, the the conversation going or the 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 topic going here. So, what you have in Africa, you can you really understand when you contrast it to the West. So, when you contrast Africa to the West, um, you really start seeing you get more insights about the West than about Africa itself. So when you look at the West from Africa's vantage point, as I do, you see a you see clown world. <laughs> the West is clown world. The West is La La Land. The West is this fantasy place rife with luxuries, uh, decadence and psychosis. Um, there's a it's hard to to describe. It's almost like the West is like this land of the lotus eaters. All these people just uh, decaying in from decadence living in this like i said fantasy world in this clown world um but with all these man-made horrors just beneath the surface just beneath the sugar-coated um superficial surface so the best metaphor i can use to explain what i mean is if you've ever i think you've encountered if you like sci-fi films you've encountered the sci-fi scenario where it's almost become like a trope where something extraterrestrial impacts planet earth and the protagonists of our story uh, live far away from the impact site but encounter like mutations or slight distortions uh, whatever impacted earth kind of mutates and distorts things that are already here and those things spread from the epicenter and then are encountered by our uh, protagonists but and they all spread from the direction of that first impact and then in the third act uh, the protagonists usually go to ground zero or the epicenter and there the dis distortion and the mutations are at its zenith and like it's uh, everything is to the nth degree it's like a completely different planet there and that is if you contrast western society to africa you get that you get the, you get little elements of it here on the african continent you get uh, ideas from the West coming here, people from the West coming here, products from the West coming here, ideologies from the West coming here, but culture, cultural impacts from the West coming here. But at the same time, then you just have, it, they don't last very long here. So you get, you get these little glimpses of the West here, but it's still very, very much a different place. That's why I always talk about greetings from the dark continent, because it's still a very impenetrable place for Western culture and for the West itself. It's still very much its own thing. It's one of the last untamed continents. Um, it's really something special in that regard. So Africa is, is raw. Here you have reality in your face uh it's while the west is pretty much everything is refined into oblivion whether that be refined products or refined food or refined uh, materials or refined cultural aspects everything is refined to a, a point where it's almost destroying what it was trying to refine a bit a good example is the west is pretty much uh, the the pink goo of mcdonald's that pink goo that the food is made out of that you've seen um it's refined into nothingness. It's almost refined. The, the, the nutrients and the, the, the vitamins have been refined out of it. Um, that's the, the type of, uh, the type of, uh, contrast that I would say, but to Africa is still very raw. It's a place of, it's a place of, uh, stone and a place of, uh, uh, much more raw elements. So, to put it then very simply, uh, Africa is the red pull and the uh, outside is the matrix. <laughs> Here you you still you still have uh, you still touch reality. You still touch grass here. Reality is not too far away. It's not too deeply buried. Um, but in Europe and America and the West is is the matrix. In large parts of Asia, that's the matrix, man. <laughs> it's, 
it's it, it, it's incomparable so the other thing about africa that i've noticed is how europeans come here and reinvent many aspects of themselves here so you get for example the englishman that comes to africa and he becomes the rhodesian um a completely different being uh not completely different but in large regards different and he identifies as <coughs> excuse me he identifies as rhodesian not as a an englishman <coughs> so uh it actually relates to this book which is one of my my favorite books it's called flug in die namme i don't know if you can see there so it's by henu martin i've re read this book probably uh i've probably read it four to four or five times at different intervals in my life uh, the first time actually my father read it to me when i was very little and then the other times afterwards was me reading it for myself and it's about well the the author henu martin it's not a fiction it's a, a henu martin and his friend what was his name um let's see um uh, uh well henu martin and herman korn uh, were two German geologists in Southwest Africa, which is uh, uh, Namibia today. Uh, and during the Second World War, they didn't want to go to war. They didn't want to get conscripted. So they fled into the desert, into the desert um, to go live there um, for years. Uh, and they lived there they just took their dog their bucky and some supplies and they built like a house there and they lived in a cave and they lived off the land and they encountered bushmen and they encountered all the wild animals there and they grew uh all these little things there uh like uh wild plants and harvested them and yeah but the thing is and in the end um uh, I'm not, okay, I'm not going to spoil the ending. Um, but yeah, this book is not a fiction. It's based on Henu Martin's diary during that time. So it's just, the whole book is just his diary. So there, um, in the, here's a photo in the book of the, the writer, Henu Martin, and their dog, Otu, in their cave where they lived. You see there, yeah. So there's their cave that they they fitted out with all the little things that they collected there in the desert um but yeah it's a fascinating book it's it's probably one of my favorite books and yeah so but why i wanted to show that book is that book captures the spirits of africa very much uh sp especially from the perspective of someone with a western heritage or western background like these german geologists um I mean, Henu Martin writes in that book, it's not just a, a documentation of everything they do. It's also his philosophical thoughts during that time, living in, in nature uh, with no other human contact for years in the desert. And he's actually, it's interesting to see his thoughts develop over time. Um, he becomes less, um, what's the word? Um um he becomes less domesticated he becomes more wild as the years go on um let's see i saw there was a question here um um oh yeah Ruvane says africa is not america at all oh well tell me about it <laughs> um Let's see. Yeah, uh, there was a question on. Oh yeah, uh, Lisa Parrot asks, "Where can I get this book?" Well, it's very hard to find, unfortunately. Uh, you're going to have to look either on like Gumtree or secondhand book. You're not going to be able to buy it new. You're going to have to buy it online secondhand, or you're going to have to just look at in every secondhand bookshop that you encounter, as I did until I found it. Um, so I'm very lucky to have a copy. I know my father also has a copy of his own, and I think my brother also has one because he also they both also love the book. Yeah, no, it is very hard to find exactly. Um, all right. So yeah, I just wanted to show that as an example of a, a perfect uh, example of that uh, how Africa enchants a, a Western mind to a point where it 
Africa becomes part of you. Um, as Impia van Weyck Lowe um, observed in his book, um, Liberale Nationalisme, where he observed that Afrikaners are a, uh, the, the, the avatar between Europe and Africa, where you're not just of Europe, you're also of Africa. And Africa has shaped our language and our thoughts and our culture and our philosophy and our worldview to such a point where if we were to remove those elements, it would remove a significant part of our culture and its uniqueness. So anyway, um, <clears throat> Yeah, and the other thought that I had while we were traveling is that uh, in Africa, the subconscious, as Carl Jung um, identified it, is always just below the surface. In, in places like Europe or America, it's often very suppressed. It's very out of sight, out of mind. But in Africa, it's very close to the surface, and it's very, um, it's, um, sometimes very uh, in your face. So here's just a few thoughts that I uh, wrote down. Um, it's not really an essay structure yet, but uh, so I wrote here while I was there in the African bush uh, here in, um, I think this was during in, when we were in Botswana. <clears throat> uh, in Africa, the, it's a place of no pretenses, frank, raw, real, ugly, in your face, untamed, no facades or empires of lies. <laughs> this was during April. Everything here isn't resting precariously on a carefully crafted foundation of dishonesties. Uh, no utopias, no soil for utopian thinking to last long. And that is something that I have also noticed is um, here in Africa, uh, European utopianism comes to die and to be scrapped for parts. Um, utopian ideologies don't really last long here in Africa, specifically not the European strand of it uh ideas like <laughs> uh, ideas like liberalism just don't grow here it's like the it's like certain plants don't grow in certain types of soils if if liberalism was a plant it it wouldn't really be able to grow here in africa it just dies everywhere where it tries um or it, it grows but it's this little stunted little plant almost like a bonsai and it doesn't really go farther than that um <laughs> uh let's see here. um oh rt pandai says uh i see there it is an english version of the sheltering desert i think that is the english title i i didn't know there's an i've, I've no actually i've i've heard about the english version i think i'm talking under correction i think that is the english title Lori says, good evening from Finland. Good evening, Lori. Thank you for tuning in. Gatskop Software says, hello, Arons. Hello, Gatskop Software. Ik hoop het gaan goed daar aan jou kant. All right. So, where was I? Right. So, Africa is a place where humanity is as it is, not as we want it to be. So, here in Africa, you get you still see humanity as it is very much um, unfiltered uh, in, in Europe and in America and other countries, many uh, modern, fully modernized countries or westernized countries, rather, I should say. Um, it's, it's not as easy to see hum humanity as it is. And that's why often that's where you get these distorted ideas of human nature, these fictional ideas of what humans are like. Um, and then people, because they just they live in these artificial matrixes in the West, they think it's true. But then they come to a place like Africa, and it just all that falls apart. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, the time here in Africa also works a bit different. Um, it it slows. So when you're there, and I'm not talking about in a joking fashion, like when uh, the the stereotype of like. In Africa, you have to be patient. Uh, everything goes slower. No, it's uh, in regards to waiting in lines and getting your your mail uh, and getting services, uh, service delivery, and everything. No, it's I'm talking about rather a bit more abstract when you are there in the bush and you're sitting there on the top of a mountain. And culturally as well, in in from my experience, cultures that were developed in Africa also have a very unique sense of time time is almost not endless but it's take this as an example so in the west everyone walks around 
with a, a watch on their wrist. There's a watch on your wall or a clock on your wall. There's a clock in the middle of town. There's a, a, a bell that rings every time uh, an hour passes. There is a, a clock on the wall at work. There's a clock uh, in your car. There's a, there's a clock everywhere. Time is constantly in your face. This is something that uh, Spengler wrote about, um, the, the, the West's obsession with time. And time is just everywhere. In your face, constantly you being reminded, it's time, you're late, you have to be here at this time, this time. In Africa, that's that's not the case. We're, in Africa, many cultures you are not as fixated on time at all, in, in contrast to, to the West when it comes to, uh, like, as I just explained. Um, in Africa, there's the sense of the, I use the, the symbol of the setting sun. So if uh, the West is, um, uh, if you can see the West through the metaphor of the clocks everywhere, Africa's sense of time is represented by the slow setting sun, where today was a great day, tomorrow is another day. We take it day by day. And uh, if we survive tomorrow, the next day is also a great, is going to be a great day. And that's a that's the 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 perception of time that you when you you only understand it really when you live in africa when you've experienced the environment here when you've experienced the, the lifestyle here you get that sense of time takes on a new form <clears throat> so i've already covered that um yeah many western ideologies come to africa like almost like alien artifacts they come here and try to to set up a base and then it just doesn't work out um and then the base gets scrapped for parts um and what i mean by that scrap for parts maybe just for clarity take for example the idea of hmm, Take the idea of modernization, the idea of the, the modern city. So in the West, you have this idea of work towards building a, a city that works, that runs efficiently like a clock. But in Africa, you often get this misconception that you, that is displayed in, for example, in the speeches by Sir Ramaphosa, where he talks about, we're going to build skyscrapers and we're going to build a bullet train. Um, it's taking elements from westernization and western ideas or modernization but it's not applying them in the right order for so it's the same type of logic where if you were to say that oh i see everyone that's successful and rich wears a suit therefore if i wear a suit i will be rich and successful it's um it's that cargo cult thinking that i covered in my in my video the ans the the cargo cult of the southern tip of africa um, you can either read my piece on it if you type in the cargo cult to the southern tip of Africa, or you can listen to me talk about it on this channel. There's, there's a video there where I do that. Um, but yeah, that's an example of in Africa, many of these Western ideas come in. Elements of them are adopted, but other elements are rejected. And many of these Western ideas and ideologies don't really function as parts. They only function as a whole. So when you only take parts of them, it, it becomes something else, or it's, it doesn't really resemble the thing that it was originally. Um, yeah, so that's what I mean by uh, utopianism coming here to be scrapped for parts. <clears throat> hmm. Another thing um, that's uh, that's definitely interesting about Africa is the fact that Mortality is a lot more of a reality here than it is in many Western countries, in Europe or in America, or even in many Asian countries as well. Um, mortality is much more accepted. That sense of memento mori, remember you are mortal. That's that's very evident in Africa. Everyone here, or not everyone, vast majority of people here are very, very aware of their mortality. They're very aware of the dangers of life, and they're very aware that their life can just be snuffed out at any moment. Um, that's something that I've also noticed, where in the West, I get the impression that that sense of uh, mortality, knowing and being aware of your mortality, is very much pushed to the side often. It's something that's not in modern times confronted or really dealt with. It's suppressed. Um, and you saw no better example of that than during COVID, during the, the pandemic, where 
the, the increasingly secularized societies of the West were paralyzed with fear when confronted with their mortality or the threat of death. Whereas in Africa, people, uh, many people were just going about as if nothing was going on. As like, oh, uh, okay. Um, in the West, people were walking around with like fish tank looking apparatus on their heads and keeping their children away from any other human contact and not wanting to send their children back to school until there's no more COVID cases anywhere on the planet. And what if, what if a new disease comes and what if that, that, that type of fear of death, what if I die of COVID? What if my husband gets COVID and dies? What if my wife gets COVID and dies? What if my child gets COVID and dies? What if I get COVID and die? That fear that gripped the West in spectacular fashion. I mean, you saw this, the, the, the worst examples are in, in Australia and in New Zealand. Um, it's just fear of the reaper. It's, but it, that stems from a civilization and cultures that have not in recent times confronted death meaningfully and dealt with and uh, um, processed death correctly. We try to escape death. We try to postpone death. That's what Western culture has become. We don't talk about it. We don't face it. Here in Africa, we face it. Here in Africa, we talk about it. Here in Africa, it's very much, um, it's, uh, it's, it's everywhere. It's constantly, you're reminded of your mortality. So it's not perfect. It doesn't mean that uh, in, in Africa, there's no fear of death and that uh, COVID hysteria didn't grip many people here as well. But the reaction is night and day. Um, if you compare Western countries to many African countries, how they reacted to COVID and the threat of COVID. Um, here in South Africa, people, many people were just walking around not wearing masks ever or adhering to lockdown rules. Um, and they didn't really care that there was this dangerous virus out there that's going to kill all, the, all of humanity. What if you die? What if you're the 0.1% of people that die? Whatever that little stat is. So, yeah, I think that demonstrates my point um, well enough. So, <clears throat> <coughs> I hope that's not the Rona. That would be spectacular irony. <laughs> Let me check what's going on in chat before I continue. Uh, Sino Shur says liberalism is a product of a high trust homogenous nation, which is why it's on the deathbed. Let's see. Um, Laurie says I can certainly tell Western Northern Europe are drowning in wokeness and idealism in the political elites. Absolutely. As Carl Jung said, uh, all addictions are bad, whether that be heroin, alcohol, or idealism. Rick say, Yarnia. Yarnia. Jonathan says something very interesting. Jonathan Kate says culturally there's no place like home having traveled to europe i'd rather stay here yeah jonathan that's actually something i've written a lot about um i've done a lot of videos on it um about that whole question of why don't you just immigrate um i did a great uh, episode where i chatted to robin kabanak about it if you just search why don't you just immigrate um conscious caracal then you'll find it great discussion it's one of the questions i always get when i appear on podcasts on european or on american podcasts they always ask me um why don't you just leave um i'm not going to get into that now you can go watch that episode um i go into in depth into answering that question and why don't you just immigrate um <clears throat> so yeah and yeah um that's the thing is uh here in africa the dust gets into your veins you get tied to the continent um i'm i'm here i'm gonna stay here uh, as long as it's possible <clears throat> uh jonathan says we'll search that video well thank you yeah it's so it's called why don't you just immigrate or why don't you immigrate conscious caracal if it doesn't come up it should you can just uh, google 
why don't you immigrate Roman Kabanak? And it should also come up. Um, you'll see it's the the thumbnail is the 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 last soldier at um, uh, the last Roman soldier at what's that place called? Oh, my memory. I was not blessed with amazing memory for small little factoids. Um, <clears throat> uh the place that when mount vesuvius erupted um pompeii there we go the last roman soldier at pompeii that's the the, uh, the thumbnail <laughs> standing guard because he wasn't relieved the freight to watch us says something very important she says how about we stay and fight for what we believe in wherever we are yeah and this is something that my friend uh, the prudentialist has also talked about quite a bit um He's done uh, recently he did a stream on um, <clears throat> uh, the death of a small town. And I think there he talks about this. But then also um, he talked about this when he and Oren McIntyre chatted recently. I can't remember where, if it was on Oren's channel or his. But they talked about it. They talked about where, and they actually talked, they, they used me as an example and said, just as I uh, am staying here in South Africa, to fight for my culture and to build something here because this is my home and that's why i'm not going to leave they are also not just going to leave america when things get tough because that's their home and that's where they are going to dig their trenches that's another episode that i think or you'd also enjoy if you like that topic search uh, time to dig trenches uh time to dig trenches russell lamberti it's on my uh it's on my channel. I see there's a, a bot in the chat. Could one of the uh, moderators just remove and ban shot? Thanks, the freight to watch. Yeah? All right. So when it comes to... Uh, I lost my train of thought. So when it comes to... The, oh, yeah, that video. So that's another video on that topic. If you like that idea of digging a trench where you are and uh, doing what, uh, what's necessary... Uh, go check that out. It's called uh, Time to Dig Trenches by, um, oh, not by, but, uh, and Russell Lamberti is in the chat. Oh, in the, in the topic, uh, the title. So, yeah, Dimitri Papas just says three little dots. <laughs> okay. So, let's see where I was. <clears throat> oh, I see uh, RT says, um, the time to dig trenches stream was excellent. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate it. Yeah, I, it's one of my most viewed episodes here on the channel. It was really a, a, a great stream. And um, I think uh, what if you, like I said, if you enjoy this part of the topic that I've been talking about now, staying where you are, doing what you can there, that's definitely an episode to watch. Uh, so time to dig trenches. Um, that's where I talked to uh, Russell Lombardi. All right, <clears throat> let's continue. So, yeah, so the other thing is the West is struggling under the weight of just luxury beliefs where people are just adopting luxury beliefs to signal uh, their status or to signal um, their uh, position in society. So we in the past... Wait, I just want to say hello here to Meme to the Memes of Destruction. One of the the OG subscribers here, he says, "The Freight to Watch RT and Caracal." Hey, man, how are you doing? Uh, thanks for tuning in. I just wanted to give you a little shout out. So, seeing as you're one of the OGs, so when it comes to um, luxury beliefs, there's a um, uh, a great article on it. Um, let me just find it, what the title is. I'm giving you a lot of homework to do, videos to watch, uh, articles to read. Um, uh, here we go. Okay. <clears throat> so it's on uh, it's on Quillette, and the title is Thornstein Veblen's Theory of the Leisure Class, a Status Update. And it's about luxury beliefs and how they operate. It's a fantastic piece. It's by Rob Henderson. Um, I would definitely recommend it. Uh, here is, let me just put the link in the chat because why not? Um, here's your homework for after the stream. <laughs> Go check that out. Uh, I think that's uh, that's going to work. It should display now in just a moment. <clears throat> there we go. So uh, uh, Veblen's theory of the leisure class, a status update. And <clears throat> he gets into the idea of, of luxury belief. So to put it very shortly, where in the past people uh, 
signal their position in society and gain status by driving luxury cars, wearing luxury dresses and clothes, wearing luxury jewelry, getting luxury hairdos and whatever. Because now in, in modern times, those things have become more accessible to more people, it's, it's harder to signal your status, to gain status through those things. So people, instead of accumulating luxury products, they've started accumulating luxury beliefs. So luxury beliefs, for example, would be if you live in a gated community, a security complex, and you advocate no borders, saying, oh, there's no problem here. You, we should just open the borders, uh, the line, the imaginary lines. Everyone should just come into my country. But then you live into in a, in a security complex and don't have to face the, um, uh, the, 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 the issues that come with that. Um, so yeah, that luxury beliefs are basically you signaling to the rest. It's basically what, what a peacock's tail does. So a peacock's tail shows to other females that he can survive even with this massive burden, this massive uh, tail that can easily be caught by predators. Um, the same goes for luxury beliefs. You're basically signaling to other people that I can uh, afford to believe in all these absurd things that uh, if I weren't in my privileged position would cause, if those policies were to be enacted, would cause me a lot of strife and problems. Um, another luxury belief is uh, uh, in South Africa would be uh, uh, BEE, um, Black Economic Empowerment, this idea that um, yeah, racial discrimination is just fine. And uh, but in the end, it actually hurts the economy and it's morally abhorrent. But anyway, um, if you want to read more about luxury beliefs, it's yeah, Stone Philosopher says virtue signaling. It's virtue signaling to the next level. It's not just showing, hey, I'm a good person. It's showing I'm in a in such a, a privileged and high status position. I am able to believe these absurdities and advocate these policies because they can't hurt me. So the best example is the open borders one where you advocate just opening the borders and you're basically signaling that I'm I'm affluent enough to not be affected by this and can survive it. Um, that's what a luxury belief is. Um, many facets of liberalism also luxury beliefs. Yeah. Lisa Barrett says the whole pronoun issue is all about luxury beliefs. Yeah, it's, it's beliefs where you're signaling to the rest of the world that hey i can afford to have these luxury beliefs um yeah celebrities pre preaching about climate change exactly um <laughs> daniel watts says gun free south africa might be the platonic form of luxury belief absolutely absolutely great example people advocating yeah we need south africa needs to be free of guns nobody should be allowed to own a gun what you're saying that's a luck that's a like you said a platonic form of the luxury belief what you're basically signaling with that luxury belief is that i am affluent enough to uh, afford the best type of security where i will probably uh, to such an extent i can afford security that i don't really need a firearm that's 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 what it boils down to <laughs> there's a very funny comment by corona is boring but um uh, corona is boring but do the alien thing but i'm um, uh you, you guys can go check and chat so i'm not going to put it on screen because there's a there's a naughty word in there <laughs> anyway <laughs> yeah so in africa specifically luxury beliefs don't last very long and they don't they're, they're not they're very they they don't really spread to as many people because it's very difficult and very expensive to have luxury beliefs in South Africa or in Africa. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, De Freyta Watcher says, the idea of living as an ordinary person with grace is pushed back against the idea of everyone is special and deserves to be celebrated. Yeah, absolutely. Another, oh, I saw a funny tweet this week of someone who said, um, celebrities, uh, uh, showing the world how their children are like non-binary or whatever or growing up with our gender is the new the new and improved version of celebrities uh, adopting just dozens of children from the third world and telling everyone about it and doing photo photo shoots about it um yeah it's again it's one upping it's all a status thing and and this is the thing i was listening to 
the the chat between uh, Jonathan Pagel and uh, Jordan Peterson uh, on my way to work this morning, and they were talking about why do academic many academics believe all these leftist take adopt all these destructive leftist ideologies? And Jordan Peterson's answer was one of his answers was maybe academics just hate rich people. Now. I don't agree. I don't think that's why why that's happening. It's a little bit of a just a um, tongue in cheek uh, <laughs> a response. I think rather what what's going on here. It's about status. That was what I was talking about earlier. I don't think it's about money. I I don't really espouse that thing. Go woke, go broke. I don't think this is about money. This is uh, if it was about money, uh, but corporations wouldn't be chasing all this woke bullshit. But they are at their expense but anyway it's it's about status and about other things about connections and about getting uh, ahead so for example with academics uh, many ap academics adopting these absurdly far left views and ideologies that's those are luxury beliefs they are chasing status they are signaling to the world i am affluent and high status enough to be able to afford literally and figuratively to believe in these absurdities that's what i think is going on i don't think it's all about money some of it might be about money i don't think i don't think just despising rich people will drive you to publicly uh, hammering your name to the mast of some of these absurd ideas i think it's about something more primal something as primal as status i mean chasing status is literally just human nature it's it's been part of humanity since the very beginning status in the community status in the family status in the friend group status in the town status in the city status in, at your workplace that's just hardwired into humans so i think it's about status i don't i think it's a status game i don't think it's about money so um i just want to before i continue give the chat a little bit of TLC Lisa Parrott says you listen to Jonathan Pajal. I work for him. <laughs> Small world. There's a klein wereld as South Africa your wereld is. Soos volk of polisiekar of van kou kartel gesê. Ek kan nie onthou wat sê en van die twee nie. <laughs> Dink van kou kartel. Um Sean Villand says academics are communists who want to seize infrastructure from the capitalists who created it. See that is that I don't com like I, I don't completely agree for the reasons that I stated earlier. I think it's about a bit more than just material stuff. I think it's about something as old as humanity itself, something that you read about in the Bible. I mean, there's so many examples of status, chasing status, ruining people and driving them in to commit horrible sins. Um Lisa Parrott said, I don't think wokeism is about money either. It's almost religious at this point. Yes, now there we're getting more close to what's going on here. Um, that's also another element. I don't think the status thing is in every case, but I think that's a very strong element of it. But the, the new secular religion, that's the other element that I think is very strong. Um, this is an interesting comment from Sean, who says managerial revolution is just the soft power version of seize the means of production. That's that's interesting. I know what you mean. I'm going to have to think about it. I'm not just going to shoot from the hip responding to that because I'm going to have to consider it first. But that is, that's an interesting comment. Um, Belleville Pitt says selling their souls to the devil. Well, people have sold. Uh, their souls to the devil for status um, since humans have existed. Sinoshur says the Western middle class can place themselves above the upper class through their moralizing. Exactly. So whereas that's the thing. So whereas, for example, someone that's dirt poor that doesn't own anything. Well, maybe not. Okay, that's the wrong example. Whereas someone that's in the middle class that can't really afford a luxury car can take out a loan to buy a luxury car to signal for status. That means that you can't really use those types of items like luxury cars, luxury clothes, luxury jewelry, luxury watches. You can't use that anymore to signal status and to gain status. That's the problem of modernity for these status chasers. 
So they can't use those anymore because it's so much easier and widespread now to acquire those status items that they now have to resort to moral goods to do it. And that's that's the dangerous thing about it. Um, let's see here. Daniel Watts says, people also forget the religious origin of the university. Professors are the modern age monks just spreading a different faith. Absolutely, the secularized faith of the state. Um, that's the whole thing. Is that <laughs> Wherever the rainbow flag or the BLF, ugh, BLM, uh, Black, Li Black Lives Matter flag waves, BLF is black first land first, the most far left radical uh, black nationalist supremacists in South Africa, the, the political party. Um, wherever the BLM or rainbow flag waves, or that you know, it's not even you know, the rainbow flag anymore. It has like the, almost like the South African flag, the new one. It has like these little triangles on it with a circle and whatever. Um, wherever that flag waves, the the empire isn't far behind. Uh, empire uh, <laughs> of today. Let's see. Uh, Daniel says Yarvin lasers out pretty well. Yeah, yeah, uh, to a large extent. I think some some points uh, I prefer a different type of explanation, but yeah, that's a whole different stream for another day, uh, definitely. Um, big Rick Hearn says image is a big thing in Africa. Yeah, now that you say that, I've completely gotten off track of talking about Africa now. But yeah, anyway, um, I think it's a valuable part of the conversation, so I'm glad it went there. Corona is boring. Do the alien thing says uh, the devil's favorite trick for a soul sale was a bowl of food or a bowl of lentils. <laughs> That's people have sold many things for food. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no status. I think I would say status is up there with food and sex as in the uh, what's it Maslow's um, hierarchy. I can't remember exactly what all those things are, but those basic lizard brain needs of humans. I'd say status is right up there. It's it's one of the things that really, really drives people. Uh, and that's why where we get a lot of this. It's like I said, it's the next step. It's not just virtue signaling. It's um it, it, it's something more insidious than that, something a bit more. It's not just telling people, hey, I'm a good person. It's almost gloating that um, these moral goods are so expensive, expensive, metaphorically, that... I am a, that only people as affluent as me can afford them to or to, can afford to believe them. But like I said, go read that piece. It's very good. Um, uh, Stone philosopher says people with low self-esteem looking for attention. Oh, that's, that's been a problem for a long time. <laughs> um, inferiority complexes have destroyed civilization. So I can tell you that. <clears throat> oh yeah what i wanted to say earlier when i was mentioning um the prudentialist is um he's been doing these videos where he's discussing his long drives across the american countryside specifically texas on his channel go check it out if you're not subscribed to his channel yet some excellent uh content there but yeah he was talking about what how i see it is he's capturing the soul of his world of his little bubble his little corner of the world he's capturing that aesthetic and that spirit and that soul of that place to the best of his ability within his writing and his videos that he makes about that and that's why i encourage him to make more videos like that one we what that he made about the long drive uh, through the countryside is i think it's so important that people not only become conscious of the aesthetic and the spirit and the soul of the environment that they live in and their community but also that of other communities and other environments and other places um, understand tr or try to understand what uh, enchants people about the place where they live, um, about community and place. <clears throat> All right. Um, I think that almost brings us uh, to the end of um, today's episode. Um, Sinusher asks, what is your view on critical race theory from an African perspective? It seems like thinly veiled third world nationalism to me. Actually, I'm going to say the opposite. It's the most Western ideology the West has ever produced. The most cartoonishly Western. <laughs> so how's that for a hot take? <laughs> an abominable... Uh, like just a 
a cartoonish utop a cartoonishly utopian and distorted and twisted set of beliefs like critical race theory would never have been originated from Africa. It could only have originated from a decadent West. It could only have originated from a West that, in, in, Nietzsche's, word, in Nietzsche's words, had killed God. That's the only place where something abominable as critical race theory, uh, something as ethno-masochistic as critical race theory could have come from. It's not... Here's the thing. Critical race theory isn't about people of color or whatever hating white people it's about white people hating white people that's what critical race theory is about uh, it's and it's it could only have originated in the west I'll, I'll leave it at that <clears throat> all right but yeah um like i said I, I think i'm going to start wrapping it up here now uh seeing as um we are reaching the end um, of today's show. So before we say goodbye, um, I just wanted to say that, um, oh yeah, I have to uh, thank our sponsor again, uh, Bidvice, uh, the only place in South Africa that sells Bitcoin directly to your self-custody, meaning that unlike a traditional crypto exchange, you don't have to trust anyone else to hold your Bitcoin for you, which removes a lot of risk, a lot of risk that has come to the fore recently. And if you have any questions regarding what's going on in the crypto world, you can go send it to specifically to Bit, uh, Bitvice and they'll be able to give you insights very quickly. They also have a podcast called By the Horns. It's available on Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Go check it out. Very interesting. Um, I've learned most that I know about crypto. Just my questions uh, have had it answered by that podcast. And uh, there's a link in the description. Go check it out. If you're a South African um, and want to get involved with crypto, uh, go check it out. There's a link for you in the description. Um, very cool guys. So yeah, guys, that's the end of today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you're new to this channel, uh, you can subscribe for more of these types of solo episodes or interviews that I also do of interesting, um, guests. You can also, uh, leave a like that helps out the show and, uh, also share it on social media, Facebook, uh, Twitter, whatever. I also really appreciate that. Thanks to everyone that always shares my episodes. It's it's always nice to see. I really appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. And if you're watching and it's not live anymore, you can still share your thoughts in the comment section below. Go leave your thoughts or questions there, and I'll respond to as many as I can. I read all of them. And um, then also, uh, thank you very much for all your participation here tonight. It adds to the content. Thank you for all your questions or your comments. Um, Corona's boring. Do the alien thing. I'll I'll do an alien episode one time. <laughs> I'll do a high strangeness episode one day. We can talk about aliens and Bigfoot. <laughs> I'll have my colleague Jog Bruderek on. We he's also uh, into that stuff. We can talk about it. <laughs> All right, but enjoy the rest of your evening. I hope you have an excellent week, and uh, I hope the weekend comes soon for all of you. And stay safe. And God bless.